it's a, a bit of a hard world that we live in, isn't it? Will you stop and look at all the things that are going on around us? And, and I know that there are lots of good things that are out there, but we have this tendency towards focusing on, uh, on the hard things. I mean, it's not very hard to see right now, is it? If you just listen to any of the news, wherever you get it from, and there's wars in Ukraine and Israel. There are uh, now multiple barges that have hit bridges in the last week, which is not something I thought I would say multiple of in, uh, in great tragedies. There is political dysfunction. Our economy feels like it's jumping all over the place. Things are getting more expensive all the time. And uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want to know, despite all the good things I can point at, when, when are these bad things going uh, to get better? When's it going to change? Now, I can tell you what every uh, self-help coach or internet influencer or self-help program that, uh, that is out there, what they will tell you, if you want to see things changed, they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you this, and I don't have to imagine this much because I read enough books and listen to enough podcasts, and uh, Emily will tell you the weirdness of my Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube feeds means that the algorithm spit, uh, spits out to me all sorts of random information, most of which is useless. But, they, uh, but when you listen to all these folks, they will tell you just one thing, that uh, if you want something to change, if you want to uh, uh, take the plunge into something new and something different, something more exciting, whatever it is, they'll tell you, uh, well, you just need to do it. Just take that step out there. Just go ahead and do it. Be the change, they will tell you. And that sounds good, right? Now, there's something that some of you all know about me, which is that, uh, uh, you know, I see that thing, that those words, be the change, on, on some sort of, like, inspirational poster, you know, the kind, you've got the text under here, and on top of that, you've got uh, a picture of, like, mountains, or the ocean, or an eagle, typically it's framed in the poster, and it's hanging up on a wall someplace where you want people to be inspired for whatever reason. I see that, and I look at that, and I go, yes, I should be the change. But my reaction, anytime I walk into something and I'm looking at that, I'm like, oh, this needs to change. <coughs> Excuse me. I can tell you the first place I begin to look. I begin to look for the adult in the room. And here's my problem. Um, I get up and I look in a mirror in the mornings. See little bits of gray hair starting to pop up. Those uh, laugh lines that you have that are beginning to be permanent in nature. I think they're called wrinkles, maybe. Um, uh, trying to do that. I, I'm starting to have those aches and pains that happen not because I had some great and crazy story about a time I was hiking up Mount Everest in shorts and a t-shirt because I'm that dumb, but because I just tried to get up off the couch. And I've realized, I've had to realize, and this is a hard lesson, I am the adult. I don't want to be the adult in the room. They tell me, be the change. I'm like, no, I'm looking around for the adults who are going to take care of this. And then I look in the mirror and I realize, no, I am the adult. I even do that thing where I look in the mirror like Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, look in the mirror dimly. And I'm like, I do that. That's because I haven't put my contacts in yet. I'm there. Now, my generation, we, we look at some of these things and... Uh, we were, we were told growing up that we could do all of these things, that we could be the ones who were going to make all of the big changes, and, and we were the ones who uh, were built in with all of these expectations of the great things that we were going to do. But we were also built, built in with uh, a little bit of cynicism, right? Because we grew up watching Wile E. Coyote. That worked really well to take a step out in faith and to take the, take the plunge into something until, internet, or until excuse me, cartoon physics hits, right? Wiley Coyote can take a step out and he can walk really far out in the middle of nothing until he does what? He looks down, yeah. And it's a long way down to the bottom of that canyon floor. Or we grew up watching Indiana Jones. Remember that scene? I think it was in The Last Crusade where there's two sides of this chasm and he has to take a step out in faith that he can do this and there is nothing there. That's where we are. At some point along the way, all of the great hopes that we had for something to, to be big, to be great, and to change, uh, seems to have fallen apart. Not that good things haven't happened. Great things have happened. Good things have been wonderful. But 
we have this tendency towards focusing on uh, the things that didn't. For my generation, for all of the times where we stop and we say, but look at all the good things that have happened. We, we look back and we say, yes, but we were coming of age when the stock market collapsed. We grew up in the shadow of 9-11 and school shootings and wars and environmental problems and all of those things that we can point at. And, and this, is, this is when, uh, at different points in time, Joel, if you're on the internet at all, uh, you'll hear someone pipe up in the comments section and I'll say, you whiny millennials, just stop already. That's all you do is whine about all the things that are wrong. And, uh, so here's the reminder that whether you're a millennial, whether you're a zennial, whether you're Gen Alpha, but uh, Gen Alpha's not going to remember much of anything right now because they're all very tiny. Um, or you are a boomer or Gen X or you're part of the greatest generation. All of us have had those markers in our growing up years of when things didn't go well. When we were thinking we could make the change, we could do this, we could make whatever it is happen. The world can be different because of what we're going to do. And then it doesn't work out that way. We've all got those things that we can point to. And this is why I really, really appreciate Mark's way of telling the gospel story. Because Mark ends his story in verse 8 of his gospel. Now if you look at chapter 16, you say, but it can't end in verse 8 because we've got verses 9 to the end of the chapter that are in there. If you look at those sections, you'll have one part of it that is always marked the shorter ending and one that is marked the longer ending. Because uh, our earliest manuscripts of Mark's gospel all stop at verse 8. Verses 9 and on were added later. Now we have canonized those, and those are useful, and they're great parts of the gospel to have. But Mark stopped his telling of the Easter story with these words. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Happy Easter? Now you can read those words as fear. That when they went to the tomb, they were afraid. They were afraid of all the things that they had seen, and they didn't know what to do with that. And that's okay to read them as being fearful, because you should, but we should also read those words in a different way, which is, this is also... A, the women who went to the empty tomb is standing there. They're on the precipice of something different, something new. They're staring out, like Wiley Coyote did, like Indiana Jones did, like we often feel like we're doing, off the edge of something. We don't know where we're going to go next, and we're being asked to take a step out in faith that there is going to be something there to hold us. They're faced now with a choice. Do we continue on, or do we turn around and go home? The women who went to the tomb that day didn't know that they were going to go up there, and they were going to be faced with such a monumental choice of do we go home, or do we accept what we have been told? Now, if you, look at the, if you look at the story, you would say, well, but they did. They turned around and went home. I'm like, yeah, but that's not where the story is. This is a very big precipice of that chasm that they're standing on. They needed some time to figure all of this out because they were struggling with what they had seen. And they are not going to be the only ones that struggle with this. What I like about Mark's gospel is that we are faced with the struggle. Mark puts it out there for us to see and they're all going to do it. It's not just the woman who showed up at the tomb. We call him Doubting Thomas for a reason. All the rest of the disciples are going to have their own moments of struggling with this. And we can even look at the two guys on the road to Emmaus who walked with Jesus for most of the day and didn't recognize him. Always wondered how Clark Kent could get away with it. Just putting on a pair of glasses and everyone would never see Superman. Well, here's the first century version of that. And it worked because they weren't expecting Jesus to be there. No matter the rumors that they had begun to hear that maybe something had happened at the tomb, maybe Jesus was alive, for them in their world at that time, dead mean dead. Dead meant dead. You didn't come back from that. And so they didn't expect to see Jesus there. Except he is risen. Except if you are ready to step out in faith, and know that he is alive. Are you ready to live in faith with the sure and certain knowledge 
that Jesus is risen. That's why I like this passage out of Mark so much, because it shows the struggle. In other Gospels, Jesus will tell the disciples, go and wait in Jerusalem until I send the Holy Spirit to you to tell you what to do next. And that's a good thing. This isn't Jesus trying to tell them to do this because he still has forms to fill out before everything is ready. This isn't for, this isn't the Holy Spirit waiting to get its, uh, its visa approved to enter the country. This is to give the disciples and the earliest believers space to process everything that has happened. They're being asked to make a big step, big step, and their world has been spinning. There are only so many life-changing and world-altering events that you can go through in 48 to 72 hours before you need some time to process that. You need to be able to turn your brain off and turn it back on again so you can figure out what is going on. So I ask if you're ready to take a step out in faith. But more importantly, the question I'm asking is, are you willing to take the time and space that you need to process what happens on Easter? Because the first thing to do is not to be able to take the plunge or to be the chain. But the first thing to do is just find the time to process, to understand what Easter means. The Easter season lasts for seven weeks before we get to Pentecost. Now, I know what those seven weeks look like around here because you all have heard me say this before. I've seen your calendars. Mine looks a little bit like that at times. Where it's full, it's busy, all the things that are going on, all of the activities of spring are taking place. We're getting ready for graduation. We're getting ready for um, ball games, for everything that's going on. And it's also the middle of spring. I know what happens in the middle of spring. You start to plan for all of the summer activities, and so that takes some work to get all of that done, too. And uh, finding extra time, extra space in the middle of all that is hard. And I know what we're most worried about in all of that. We're worried about, am I going to be able to get it all done, right? And I know what that looks like because I have all of those same to-do lists sitting on my computer waiting for me to be able to check all of that stuff off. This is also, though, why we need grace. Grace tells us that we don't need to get it all done. After all, if you look back, how many years have you ever actually gotten all the things done that are on those lists that we put together at this time of year? I've never gotten all the things done on that. But my my, my, uh, my to-do list always assumes I'm going to be way more productive than I really am or I'm capable of. Grace tells us that we don't have to get it all done and that it is going to be okay. Easter tells us that it is impossible to get it all done on our own as it is. Look at the earliest disciples. They couldn't get it all done on their own. They needed Jesus to help them figure it out. If you need another version of this story that tells you how hard it is to get everything done, look at the Jewish religious leaders of the time. They had done everything in their power to take Jesus out of the equation, to remove his voice from the conversation. And they had done it in such a way that they were, they were getting him taken care of at a time when, when the news of his, of his crucifixion could be hidden against all of the noise and the backdrop of Passover. You know, it's like when you see, uh, you know, governments or, or organizations or businesses or whatever, they, they, drop, uh, they, they drop what could be damaging reports on a Friday afternoon before a three-day weekend, right? As you know, no one's going to see that. Everyone else is off about their business. They had thought they set it all up so perfectly. They forgot to give Jesus the memo because Easter morning comes and he undoes all of the work that they had put in. Even they couldn't get it all done. The women at the tomb would eventually figure this out. When they had time to figure, to, to understand and to process what they had seen and what the angel had said, and they remembered all that Jesus had told them, they figured it out and they understood now what had happened and they were ready to take that stuff out. To know that Jesus had risen, and in fact they were the ones who gave the very first Christian sermon. The very first Easter sermon came from the women. I had a friend of mine recently that was looking, he was looking for a coloring page to give to, to some of the kids at his church that, that described the first, the first Christian sermon when the women were going and telling the story. And for reasons 
Uh, he couldn't find one that was uh, scripturally accurate, so he did apparently what you do nowadays. He plugged all the information into an AI, and it came up with this. I love this image of the woman telling uh, the disciples, he is risen. The tomb is empty. That's what that first sermon would have looked like. What we all need to know as we go into this next week is that we can take the space and the time that we need to figure out what Easter means. To prepare ourselves to take a step out in faith for what God has in store. And that it will be okay if everything else doesn't get done because we're spending that time that we need with God. Other things will get themselves sorted out, whether they get done or not. But for now, we come to prepare ourselves to take that journey to see what God has in store for us.